Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Armchair Art Tour Polar Edition. Uh, this is part two of our series. My name is Melanie Blake, and I'm the director of Classical Pursuits. I'm here today with philosopher, snow and nature lover, Wendy O'Brien. Uh, she's going to be talking to you about the artists of Cape Dorset in Nunavut, Canada, which is far up in the north, sort of between the Baffin Bay and the Hudson Bay. And Wendy's going to talk a little bit more about um, its its location. Um, and we are really happy to have Wendy here with us. Happy to have all of you here. A couple of quick reminders before we start, just to make the webinar the best experience for you. You can adjust your audio settings by either going to the uh, the word audio in your go to webinar control panel. If you click on that, you'll open up the fields and you can adjust the volume to your liking. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little bit of a scratchy throat today. And you can uh, we will be taking questions uh, after the after the presentation. Please feel free throughout the presentation and after to type in your questions. To do this, click on the word questions in the interface or depending on your device, uh, you might see a little question mark icon. Either of those will open up the question field and you can type in your question and we will get to it at the end. If you're having any tech problems, uh, also please Put in the questions. Um, Samantha Clark, the marketing manager of Worldwide Quest, is, is also here with us. I'm sorry, Samantha, for, I skipped over that. Uh, Samantha's here, and she'll be um, she'll be helping with any troubleshooting throughout the throughout the presentation. Uh, as all of you know, there's there's bad weather throughout a lot of the North American continent today. Uh, so you know, if we do have any uh, little bit of a temporary problem with an internet connection or such, uh, we just ask you to please be patient. Uh, it's quite, uh, quite extreme, quite extreme for uh, even for February. Um, as I mentioned, this is part two of our series. We, Wendy will finish up next week. We're gonna have a very special Q&A with Wendy and the watercolor artist, David McEwen. David paints in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, and that's going to be just gorgeous. His paintings are so full of light and yeah. So please join for that. Um, there'll be a follow-up email with information on how to sign up if you haven't got that already. Uh, Wendy is doing all kinds of other stuff with Classical Pursuits and Worldwide Quest. She has a small group seminar, so a more interactive experience on um, Atonement by another McEwen, Ian McEwen, a uh, fabulous novel that starts in March, March 17th. We'll have info about that as well. And we have a lot more uh, seminars with Wendy coming up in the spring. We should have more information up on our website soon. And we have a whole other series of free presentations continuing on Thursdays. Um, so after Wendy finishes her series, I'll be talking about uh, Sicily and the literature of Sicily. And then in um, that's March 11th and uh, March 18th and 25th, we have Sean Forrester back for another installment of Armchair Art Tours. He'll be talking about uh, Dutch painting, well, Dutch and Flemish painting in the 17th century. So any questions about any of that, please feel free to email Samantha or me, and we can direct you on how and where to sign up. All right, well, Wendy, I'm gonna stay on as you asked, but I'll turn it over to you for Armchair Art Tours Polar Edition Cape Dorset Artists. Thank you, Melanie, and thank you everybody for uh, joining me again, if you were here last week, for our conversation about uh, Wilson Snowflake Bentley. And hello to anybody who is new onto our Armchair Art Tours, uh, the Polar Express version. I have to say I was feeling a bit, a bit sad, uh, or a bit bad maybe more accurately, uh, about doing a series on winter, uh, artists who are fascinated with the winter or who lived in wintry places, uh, during a polar vortex, who knew? Uh, that's all I can say. And I don't know, Melanie, did I ever tell you, Melanie, that when I was a kid, um, my family used to call me Wendy the Weather Witch? No. <laughs> well, what is, why? Why? 
because I had this uncanny ability to tell when it was going to snow. And, you know, since then I've started to think, you know, maybe I just am really sensitive to air pressure, whatever that is. But I used to always be able to tell when it was going to snow. And I was, I was, you know, my, my sisters used to say, yes, you're the weather witch, you conjure up snow. And I have to say, after talking about Wilson um, Snowflake Bentley last week, I thought I had done it. Uh, because uh, some of you may know that uh, it was snowing when we spoke uh, last week. This is my garden. Uh, some of you who are with me in garden uh, tours, uh, you've seen pictures of it before. So this was it last week. And basically, it snowed and it snowed. And well, this is my garden now. And let me show you. That's a fire pit. And we've had this much snow since last we were here. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, right now, guess what it's doing? Yes, it's snowing. And we're in for another 10 to 20 centimeters here in Hamilton uh, yet this afternoon. Uh, so yeah, snow, uh, did I bring it on? It's a big question. And it seems somehow, as I said, kind of cruel as all of North America deals with this polar vortex to ask you to consider once more uh, images of, of ice and of snow um, and, and artists who live in those places. But, but actually then I started to think that, that maybe, maybe that's not exactly true. Um, I was thinking about this too, Melanie, as you mentioned, the going and doing the next arm, um, arm a chair art tour of Sicily and going, wow, Sicily. And, and all of our dreams about being in warm places right now. But, but this is where we are. And until the world opens up, and until we can travel again, perhaps looking at the artwork of the artists of, of Kate Dorset in Nunavut, in the north of Canada, isn't such a bad thing to do while we deal with the cold weather, the ice, and did I mention snow, snow, and oh yes, more snow on, on its way. Now, a couple of things before I get started. I'm going to look at the, the works of the Cape Dorset, Dorset sorry, artists, or it's now called Kinget, uh, this particular area of, um, of Canada. I'm going to look at their work, but I'm not going to look at their work through the lens of their indigeneity. Um, there are so many wonderful scholars with much more understanding of the heritage and tradition of, of the people of this area, the indigenous people of this area to help us understand those questions and those issues. And there are much better scholars who are able to help us address the history of the social injustices um, towards the indigenous people uh, all across Canada, but of this area in particular. And, and you'll see at the end of my presentation today that I have a list of resources that are available, which will provide you with links to people who are able to fill in those blanks or to address those issues. Now, what I want to do with these extraordinary, this extraordinary group of artists is I want to look at them through a bit of a different lens. Uh, as many of you know, and as Melanie mentioned in her introduction, I'm a philosopher of art. So I ask a sort of different set of questions as I look at works of art. I ask questions about how these artists, well, to, to be really honest, I think I ask a lot of questions about how they help us to live. Um, the uh, great uh, aesthetic theorist, Immanuel Kant, talked about art as being the practice for living. And that's very much the lens with which I want to approach these artists today, to look at what they can help us to learn about confronting ice and snow, about confronting a winter of one kind or another, the winter many of us are experiencing. I'm experiencing right now. I wish I could show you out my window. Uh, <laughs> experiencing on the outside. But also, I think the winter that so many of us have been experiencing on the inside as the pandemic continues to rage uh, and as social issues continue to challenge us in all kinds of ways. It's Snow Kate Flake Bentley would have had us look at and would help us to see um, the beauty in winter in something as small and as simple as a snowflake. I think the artists of Kingate can help us to confront sort of the broader landscape to teach us something about resilience, something about 
beauty, uh, maybe about mystery and about wonder, not of being someplace else and otherwise, but being where we are, being in the midst of winter. To help us do that, not to fight against the elements, but maybe to find a better way to find a place within them. The artist that we're going to talk about, uh, whoops, there we go, uh, come from here. This is a, a photograph of what used to be called Cape Dorset. Uh, it's now known as Kinget. Kinget. Uh, and Kinget is located, well, I like this map. So I mentioned I'm in Hamilton, Ontario, in, in Canada. And I love this map because it actually has Hamilton on it. Um, Kinget is in Nunavut. It's all the way up here. In fact, it is 2,340 kilometers from where I'm sitting uh, this afternoon. Uh, here's a bit of a closer look at Nunavut. Uh, this is our northernmost, uh, as you can see, our northernmost territory in Canada. Uh, its name, here we go, and here's Kinget. Its name was changed from um, of Cape Dorset to Kinget in 20, I think it was 2020 or 2019, uh, just before we underwent uh, the pandemic. You can see here, it's just off the, the southernmost tip of Baffin Island, and you can see how far north we are uh, here in this part of Canada. Now, this is sort of what it looks like most of the time in Kinget. And, and I have to say, um, I went online just before we started to find out what the weather was like there at this moment. Well, right now they're having the high for today in Cape Dorset, the high of minus 26. That's uh, just below minus 27 um, in uh, Celsius uh, if you're there. And it's 28 kilometer an hour winds. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the high for today in Cape Dorset right now. It's feels like minus 37. Uh, the other thing I should tell you is that the sun rose today at 7.50 and it's gonna set at 4.50. Uh, Nunavut is just coming out of the darkest part of the, of the year for them, the, the really long dark days of December and January, getting a little bit more light each and every day. Now, does it look like this all year long? No. Uh, it, it doesn't. Much of the time it's uh, covered in snow, uh, but it does actually have a summertime. doesn't last long, uh, but it, it is there, and, and this is what the area looks like uh, in summer. It, it, people often think it's covered in snow all the time, and in fact, it's not. Um, I love this particular work. This is by Kinojak Ashavak, who we'll look at uh, more of her work in a little bit later today. But this is a work she did, she created called uh, Nunavut Arland in 1992. And she created it to commemorate the signing um, of the Tung Tungavik Federation Settlement uh, in May of 1993, which granted to the Inuit of the Eastern Arctic a permanent homeland. And what we're looking at is an image of the um, Inuit um, the six seasons. Instead of having four seasons, they have six seasons. And in this particular image, she's able to kind of chart out the, you can see on the outside, you can see the animals that, that will visit. And you see the difference here in the ice flows that are there. And here you can see the differences in the geographical elements on the very outermost ring. Uh, it is a magnificent work, and if you ever have a chance to see it in person, um, plan to spend lots of time looking at all the very careful details she's put into this image. Yet, yeah, um, in this part of the world, they have six seasons that are recognized by the Inuit, and thank you very much to Wayne Olson, uh, who um, offered up uh, and made accessible this, um, this more literary version of this beautiful, stunning version by Ashavak uh, of, of those seasons. Here you have a sense of how exactly the weather changes and the light changes across time. This is from, as it says on the bottom of my screen here, a 2016 Nunavut land use plan uh, that was created. 
but you can see here we are here we are in february very cold and the sun is just starting to res resume uh there's sea ice they're headed towards bright and frozen days but but there's a little bit of time before that's going to take place and that's going to happen yeah it is a place um, that's changing dramatically i know we've all probably been reading and hearing about some of the dramatic changes that are taking place in the arctic as a result of climate change but what's special about this place is well there is these are these shapes these kind of formations look how rounded the mountains here have become how old they are and um, it's a place of incredible light as well there's another stunning image uh looking towards uh, cape dorset and and this one uh, as well beautiful light remarkable shapes and i think all of that gets translated into the the way that the artists from this area really kind of approach their very arctic environment approach winter outside and inside it's also a land that's populated by all kinds of uh, animal life here you get some caribou yes the polar bears are still there, though this one is very thin. Uh, again, one of the effects of climate change. Um, here we go. We have uh, walruses and what'll be important for us a little bit later, uh, is lots of owls. In fact, there's 266 different um, kinds of birds that uh, find their home in this land. Now, we want to take a look at a group of artists that center out of this place, a group of artists that I think are so inspired by the land, inspired by not only the wildlife, but those formations we saw, the light, by the fact that it is winter, by the ice and by the cold. Now, they've been well known since the 1950s. Where is the creation of a co op in this area? And so the artists from this place um joined together uh, they make calendars year after year uh in, in very controversial ways that like i said if you're interested in i've got some great resources uh that you can take a look at about the long and as i mentioned controversial history of of the uh, co-op in uh cape dorset there are many artists that are associated this with this co-op and with this area that i would love to have more time to explore people like Ovilu uh, Tunio, uh, Tuni, as sometimes it's called, and her beautiful sculptures. This is her here holding one. And uh, thank you to a few friends who uh, allowed me to use this photograph of a, a sculpture of hers that they have called Mother and Child. We, we could talk about Shuviani Shunu and her images that she created. Uh, she's working there now. Uh, we could talk about Peter Pizziola. Uh, and his, I like to talk about him because he was a sculptor, as you see at the bottom, but also he was a great photographer, giving us a, a sort of social um, documentary of life in this area, as well as stunningly beautiful photographs, art objects as well. We could talk about Annie Patugu uh, and her images uh, that she's creating of life on the inside, what, what domestic life is like in this place. But, but the artist that I've chosen for us to look at and to discuss this afternoon uh, a little bit are artists that well, really are looking at the landscape. Artists who are trying to capture something of the exterior world in their works. And I couldn't think of a better person for us to start with than um, Kenajak Ashvek, who we saw earlier on. We saw that um, image of hers of the six seasons she's a very well known probably the most uh, well known of the indigenous artists in canada she was really the first internationally known inuit artist for sure um it, primarily because of a film that was made about her when she was still relatively young in the 1960s by the national film board a and her image this one called enchanted owl has become kind of iconography iconography I'm not gonna be able to say it, uh, an icon uh, of Canadian indigenous art. This particular image or a variation of it uh, appears on one of our stamps. Uh, it has been put now, one of her 
variants on this image is now uh, found on our $10 bill here in Canada. For her, she had this incredible interest um, in the landscape and in the, well, in the bird life that surrounded the, her in the place where she was. She was really interested in, yeah, you got it, birds. Birds who came every year, generation after generation. Uh, and, and look, how can you not love these little snowy owls that you see in front of us? Uh, they held a particular kind of fascination for her. And there was other you know, bird life there too. Loons and ptarmigan, and this isn't a northern harrier hawks, but for her, it, it really was all about, about the owls. And she started off her career actually being a sculptor, a very skilled sculptor. Uh, here is one of her owl sculptures that uh, if you're ever in Toronto at the Art Gallery of Ontario, you can have a chance to take a look at up close. She, she started off sculpting, but um, she actually had problems with her hand and so couldn't do it as many carvers uh, discover that the hands take a beating using this art form. And so she transformed to using other media. Something about her to keep in mind is that she's constantly changing the media that she uses and sometimes even the style, even though her subject matter often remains the same. Here's one of uh, her drawings. And these drawings were done um, with pencil crayons. The simplicity of the medium, I think is part of the importance of her story, part of the thing that we can learn uh, from her. You don't need complicated art supplies in order to be able to create images of great beauty, images that make you happy uh, and that celebrate a place. Um, you can use the simple things of life. She would use pencil crayons, she would move. Uh, there we have her, we see her with a pencil, uh, busy at work. Uh, and you can see one of those sorts of beautiful plumes up here behind her and she's got another one that she's creating here. Uh, she would move eventually to doing um, first stone um, plates to allow for print making and eventually she would use a you know more complicated te technology. There's a metal plate and one of the prints uh, that she created. Something I, again to keep in mind that she's constantly going to change uh, the medium that she uses to try to capture something of the beauty of this place. The beauty of, well, well mostly birds and, and mostly owls. She did do uh, other things. This is uh, one of her most stunning works. Uh, this is her luminous char from 2008. And this is um, a, actually a, one of the stone carving prints uh, that was created. It's a, a beautiful work. She ventured away from birds for a little bit. Um, she, she did do loons and occasionally other kinds of large birds. I think this is a hawk, uh, which is interesting because her name means hawk. Um, but, but really, it, it was all for her about the owls. Now, now, why focus on owls, you might say? Because really, well, in this part of the north, they're kind of common and Nobody takes them particularly um, seriously or as a subject of, of great and pressing um, art. Well, for her, there was something more about the owl to be appreciated, something else to be considered. To create a work like this one, um, Takarilak Partridge, and I apologize for my mis mispronunciation, uh, but Takarilak Partridge, writing about her process, said how she created a work like this was the following. She usually laid out the color schemes for the drawings, but she didn't decide on the form in advance. She just let the pencil take her where it would and corrected mistakes. And as she went on, after three decades of work, her pencil continued to lead her to new and mysterious wonders. We'll take a look at how that work developed across time in just a, a, a minute. But, but that's what she was up to here. She wasn't, she wasn't gonna go to the extraordinary and the rare. She was gonna focus on the ordinary and the everyday. And she was gonna find in the ordinary and everyday things of beauty, of joy, things 
well, as we'll see in a minute, that made her happy. Now, I have to be careful because I see such joy in these works that I can often overlook the fact that her joy and her happiness wasn't, well, it wasn't because she didn't know hardship. She did. You know, she lost her father early in life. At a young age, she suffered tuberculosis and was evacuated from the area to Quebec City for a period of time. She would lose the great love of her life, Johnny Bo. She would, well, she would see only two of her 11 children outlive her. I think just knowing a little bit about the hardships, the hard things that she dealt with is important when you take a look at works like this one. But she, because she created them not despite those hardships, but I think she created them in light of those hardships. As to why it was or what it was that um, led her to, to create these owls that are so beautiful, she said, well, the following. She said, there is no word for art in my language. We say it is to transfer something from real to unreal. I am an owl and I am an happy owl. I like to make people happy. I am the light of happiness and I am a dancing owl. Perhaps no place does she make that evident more or more evident than in this. This is a work of hers called Gray Owl. Yeah, I think there is much about learning to confront winter. Winter, as I said, on the outside, winter is a physical experience, but winter as well on the inside from, from Ashavak's work. She has much to teach us about looking at the everyday and the ordinary and finding in it great beauty. Um, asked to describe a little bit more about her artistic process. She said, I just it took these things out of my thoughts and my imagination. I'm just concentrating on putting it down onto paper in a way that is pleasing to my own eye, my sense of color and form. And that sense and sensibility, she was able to transform across her lifetime. Something else I think so interesting to take from her, this constant transformation, this constant reinvention in some ways, if not of her subject matter, for sure of the medium that she was employing in, in creating works that looked like this. Indeed, she would create a work as gorgeous as the one we have in front of us. This is her Bountiful Bird created in 1986. And just look at the fun that she's finding here. I think, you know, we could talk about the technical expertise. And again, this is a pencil drawing. Can you imagine taking a pencil like the one I have here uh, in your hand and all those tiny little dots that cover the neck of the owl or all the hatching to get those wings? And then all of the birds coming out of one bird's end. Could I just say, look at those eyes. What are those eyes saying to you? It is, well, resplendent. It keeps coming to mind. But she has another work as we saw earlier called Resplendent um, Out. And I was thinking, this is an example of resplendency for me. Uh, what she was able to find and to imagine. Um, she also, towards the end of her life, created this. Uh, this is a stained glass window at Appleby College, just outside of Toronto in a tiny place called Oakville, sort of between where I'm sitting here in Hamilton and Toronto, Ontario. And, and again, this is done very close, I think it's probably her last um, completed work, done close to the end of her life. And look at the beauty and look at the celebration. and. You know, again, it was something that she created not because she didn't know other things, not because she didn't know how hard life could be, how dark and stormy life could be, but maybe, just maybe, because she did know that. 
And yet, go back to that quote, I am the light of happiness. I want to stop for just a minute and think a little bit about that with you all, if, if you don't mind. Because I was struck as I was preparing for this and revisiting her work by, by this idea of finding happiness where you are, of letting it be okay to be happy, even when things are stormy and icy, even when we're in the midst of winter. And I, I keep thinking, you know, if she could do that, how inspiring is she for us as we face winters, of perhaps a different kind, perhaps the same kind, but, but what we can take to understand the winters we're experiencing at the moment. I, I wish I could spend all afternoon talking with you uh, about her work, uh, about the intricacy uh, of, of her designs and of her technique, but I sort of wanted to um, expand a bit to see what we could learn about facing the winter uh, from other artists of this area. And the other artist I, I thought of immediately, in part because uh, the Art Gallery of Ontario a few years ago did a, in 2018, did an exhibition of Ashvat's work, along with the work of her nephew, Tim Pitsiula. And here's uh, uh, Tim uh, at the moment, not at the moment, here's a photograph of him uh, that was taken. And the thing I have to say about his work, well, Take a look at this. Now, I have to tell you, it's a great image, this particular uh, um, copy of a copy of a copy that we see on our screens all the time. Can you imagine what it looks like in person? Can you imagine the colors, the choice of colors that are there? And, and you remember I said something about light and color that you find in this particular part of uh, none of it. Um, but, but also, think about the fact that this is a pencil crayon drawing. So this is a piece of black paper that he drew on top of. I, I can't begin to think about his skill and, and his devotion to works to be able to create something that looks like this. Um, now, you may notice over here that you see a selfie stick or a camera stick and, and a camera here. Uh, he's also telling us a little bit about how he created this work at the same time as he presents it to us. He would take photographs and then go back to his studio and recreate them. Uh, just because, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to stay close to these guys for very long either. And, and you know, someone's sort of looking over his shoulder at him. Uh, here he is back in um, the studio, back in a co-op where he did his work. And you can see him with the pencil crayon and the detail and the time that it would take to create these works on black uh, construction paper or construction-like paper, black uh, graphic paper. Um, I have to say, if you haven't ever worked on black paper, if you really want to appreciate something about the art that he's creating, just try it. And, and I mentioned construction paper because, you know, uh, I, I'm a big fan of, um, you know, try whatever an artist is doing, even if you're a terrible artist like I am. So I'm going wrong between head and hand. But, but try it just so that you can understand more about the technique and, and just what it takes in order to create this work. And black paper is unforgiving. Like erasing isn't going to happen it's going to leave traces and so the precision with which you need to work and and the detail so love this photograph of him again at work because you have a sense of all the little lines that go into creating a work like this one uh, it, it, it's stunning stunning technique that he required in order to create a work like this he said of his work the following he said the thing about creating art like this is you have to be patient. Patience is number one. No one taught me how to draw. I learned this from drawing myself and every drawing I make, 
it's like learning from my mistakes all the time. Uh, that idea about patience, I think is so important to appreciating what went into the creation of the images that he did. Images, yeah, uh, of animals. Uh, this is his swimming bear um, image that he created, now owned by the Art Gallery of Ontario. Uh, but, but it's really his landscapes that I find particularly, well, there's something, something there that draws me to them. I guess part of what I admire about his artwork and really the artwork of all the Cape Dorset artists is that they weren't always dreaming about other places and other spaces of elsewhere and otherwise. You know, life wasn't always better. Beauty wasn't to be found someplace else, but it was to be found here, right here in the place that they were with the climate, the geography, the sky. Look at that sky. That, that they had in front of them. There's something extraordinary about being willing to find here that, that kind of elegance and that kind of beauty that, that's captured in an image like this one. I wish we could just kind of leave this image on the screen for a long time. Uh, it's a pretty good reproduction, but, but just that sense of being where you are and looking at it, looking at it afresh and finding in it, well, I don't know about you, but there's some kind of grandeur in the rock formation here and a strange beauty in the sky that isn't one kind of gray or one kind of white, but is filled with colors. Now, he was looking at the landscape that was there, always aware of the past that informed it. Um, this is from the past and you can see here the masts on the backs of the whale. He, he loves whales, uh, uh, especially bow whales, uh, but here you have some belugas as well. Um, the masks, you have to always look really carefully at his images because you'll find images of another time, images of his ancestors here of the people of the pre-Dorset people. And you'll notice as well, do you see the whaling boat that's here on the back? And, and the whales spouting from another time. All of his images are imbued with the elements of the past, but really what he was interested in trying to capture was this place and this place in, in his time. Um, this is the computer generation from 2012. He was interested in the influence of the past, but he also understood that life in this place was more complicated, that it was somehow starting to change. And he was very clear that that was what he wanted to capture, this moment in this place, with all its contradictions and complexities, with all its beauties that could be found somewhere lying in between them. Take a look at this work and we have another sense of that. This is his morning commute, which makes me giggle because I used to commute every day from Hamilton toward Toronto on planes, planes and automobiles. It was a long commute to where I worked, but it didn't look like this, I'm just gonna say. Uh, this is his morning commute from 2015. But again, you get the beauty of the place, but you get the, the equipment of the here and of the now. He, he had a clear sense of that as well when, oops, sorry, I, I thought I had another slide there and I didn't. You get a clear sense of, of those combining, of understanding that it is a, an environment that is in transition and people in transition as well or as a result of that. He said of his work that he thought that one of the best things about being both an artist and a hunter, and he was a really well-known hunter in his community, and known not only for his prowess, but also known for his generosity in feeding the community through his hunting. He said the best thing about being an artist and a hunter um, is, well, what more can I ask for than that people are noticing what we have up here? I love that line, right? What people, that people are noticing what it is we have up here that that is what he was doing. And 
And it wasn't a barren or an empty land. Um, as you notice with those images of the whales that I showed you before, um, his images are filled with things. It isn't an empty or a desolate place or space, this Arctic place. It, it wasn't devoid of life. It was teeming with it. If only you dared to look. This is his magnificent work called Swimming with Giants. It was a commissioned and now is in the TD Center in Toronto, where it, it hangs as you walk in the door of its main building. And uh, this particular image is, uh, it was lent to the Art Gallery of Ontario in order for us to have it for a show that uh, took place, an exhibition that took place that I mentioned before. Uh, I love it because you can see the immensity of this piece. And again, Council Plan, the immensity of this particular work. And yeah, that this isn't a lonely or empty place, but that if you look carefully and you look for a, a long time, that, that there's so much life, that there's so much life teeming, in this case, just below the surface. And, and as I mentioned, I wanted to take a look at these artists today to see what they could teach us, what we could learn from them about facing the winters that we're experiencing uh, here and now in our place and in our time. And I couldn't help but think about this idea that there's so much life if only we have the eyes to see it. And if we're lucky enough, the eyes to record it. Yeah, whales, whales, and more whales you'll see in, uh, in his work. He was particularly inspired by them and inspired by them because he said they were so unknown and so mysterious that he, he was captivated somehow by that mystery. Perhaps another lesson, captivated by them and transformed. And again, one of the things I think it's so powerful in his work is that what he saw in the environment, what he experienced in the environment, in the place and space where he was at the time when he was with all its complexities as old and new, it was changing him. And well, I, I, I love this particular image by him. Uh, you can see down here, it says, happy, 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 the title of the work. And I thought how interesting, you know, that notion of I'm a the light of happiness from his aunt Ashava and him saying happy, happy, happy. And both of them knowing struggles and knowing hard times, still being able to adopt that attitude, still being able to allow themselves to be transformed. Well, I know our, our time is going, and I knew I was going to have this problem. So many great artists and so many uh, so little time but I, I did want to introduce you to a couple of artists from this area who are perhaps not as well known as Ashavak and Kitsilak um but I think who should be and who also have more to teach us about confronting the arctic landscape the wintry landscape of our lives um and I apologize I am sure there's people out there who could help me with my pronunciation uh and I wish you could talk to me uh, right now, but Ohotak Mikiak is my best uh, guess for it, and and I wish I could say it eloquent, eloquently because I am such a big fan of his particular works. Um, he was interested in also recreating uh, the landscapes, also in trying to get people to rethink, relook, and to try to find the beauty that lies in sometimes what looks empty and barren and colorless. Uh, here's one of his uh, artworks of the area that we're uh, taking a look at. What he wanted people to do was see that they're full of color, but it might not be the color that you see on first glance. It, it might require some extra time. And, and to also give a sense that it, there aren't barren spaces or barren places. Here we have a, a quote from him. He said, I enjoy doing colorful drawings with people and animals, birds, but especially the landscape. I used to enjoy hunting on the land, so that's what I draw. And I've done a few drawings of shamans, although I've never seen one. 
there are stories, true stories, told to me by my uh, grandmother. Um, what I think about is work and what I love to see is, yeah, this explosion of color that he found in this place. Um, light, the way that light reflected and, and showed so much more that lies there. The vastness of the place is something else that I think that his works capture so well. It's vast, but not barren. Um, go back to this particular image and you see well, the, the, I think it might be salmon, but I'm not sure. But you can see everything going upstream here. Like if you take a look carefully, like with Pitsiulak's work, you see all these little things that are embedded in the work. Uh, it, it, it's vast, but not barren. And again, an interesting message to us, for us in our time, in our place. Um, and these works he didn't think of as being impressionistic. Um, if you're interested, and I think I have it on the screen that's coming up with resources a little bit later, and I know Melanie is always so gracious and sends out uh, resources that we have available to us. A great piece in a Canadian art uh, in honor of his uh, work. And one of the things that they emphasize is that these are not impressionistic, but quite realistic from the viewpoint of the artist. Uh, same thing with Ashva, same thing with Pizzula. It was realism, not mysticism, that necessarily drew them to these places and, and to these spaces and to depict such remarkable work. They also mentioned uh, in that great article, and I'm sorry, I was looking for it, I had it here, because I was, wanted to mention uh, the, uh, the person who wrote it, because it was such an interesting introduction and I learned so much from it, um, to his work that he has this epic sense, and I love that word, this epic sense of land and water and sky that he captures in his work. And, and I'm not sure we often think about epic in relationship to snow and ice and, and um, open spaces, the way that uh, this writer sort of started to capture my imagination, getting me to think about. Oh yeah, like what if we could see these places as full of color? What if we could see winter as full of color and vast and be excited about that and not quickly reduce it to being barren and empty and colorless? How much more would there be for us to find when we look out our windows, when we look into ourselves, into the wintering part? Okay, so I couldn't help it. So I apologize, but I got one more person I really want to introduce you to because it's sort of a new generation of artists who are um, arising. And thank you very much to folks at Dorset Fine Art who uh, are, pointed me in this direction uh, through the great research that they do on Inuit art. Um, this is Ulusi Sela. And again, apologies if I've um, not pronounced it correctly, but she is incredibly interested in trying to capture landscape of the area that she is living in of Cape Dorset of Kinget. And you can see her here standing beside one of her enormous long works. And I actually showed you um, one of her images last week when I mentioned that we would be looking not only at artists who looked at the beauty that could be found in things small and simple uh, during the winter, but that artist who took us to a broader landscape asked us to expand and stretch ourselves and look beyond the simple and the little to find other elements or aspects of beauty in what was big and surrounding. Um, here's the work that I uh, showed you before uh, of, of hers. What I love about her work is she captures so many elements and aspects of all those artists that we talked about previously. And in fact, um, when she was 14, as the story goes, I think, uh, she did spend some time with uh, Asherah, and I sometimes see in her choice of colors uh, that sort of influence, but you also see it in relationship to um, Mikatech's uh, work as well. I think they've got a, a conversation going on about the land, about what it looks like, about seeing something more, seeing in greater detail, taking the time to notice maybe what are fine distinctions, but to find a kind of beauty that we too quickly and perhaps too readily would otherwise overlook. I mean, look at this. 
what a stunning piece uh, this is. And what a celebration of the land of ice and snow. Something quite different uh, from, from the, oh no, I got a shovel, uh, <laughs> approach to life. And, and a real lesson in seeing and thinking the winter again to find what other kinds of beauty might lie there, to find what sources of happiness we can find in those contexts. And obviously as well, to be able to not always do that, thinking about being elsewhere or being otherwise, seeing the fullness, seeing all the life that exists right where we are. Yeah, it's true in the winters. Uh, of our lives. Thank you so much for this way too quick, wish I had more time uh, to talk about each of these uh, artists. I do have uh, a list of resources. There are some amazing um, people online who are doing work in Inuit art and some fantastic books. I know Melanie will be sure to, um, to uh, let you all know about those uh, in uh, her follow up to this uh, to this talk today. Yes, definitely. Um, we so let me just increase my volume. Sorry. Uh, yes, we will definitely send out. Um, uh, of course, the recording so you can see this uh, see this again and go through the different images. Um, you know, in in more slowly if you like, or take, you know, take a closer look at what interested you the most. And we also will send links to to other information about these artists, because as Wendy said, there's there's really a lot out, really a lot out there. Um, so thank you, Wendy. Thank you so much. Um, we have, I think, visited a part of a part of Canada that, that's well known in, in Canada, but maybe maybe not so much outside of Canada. And it's really valuable to, you know, I think part of, part of what Classical Pursuits is trying to do through both the seminars and these presentations is is just take on, there's so much to explore in Canada, so many facets. Um, mm -hmm. And we were really keen to, to always share more of it with you. And I really, um, I saw that exhibition that was uh, in Toronto a few years ago and brought back a lot of very happy memories. And isn't it funny, you would think about, you know, happy memories in wintry places, uh, which is yeah. part of the reason I love their work. It's because, you know, we, we tend to see white, white, and more white, and, and desolate. Uh, and uh, I love the way these artists are teaching me to see that there's more if I just have the eyes to see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. So, so many so many images to go back and look at more closely and and they're just they're incredible i love i love them um okay so let me we have a whole lot of questions here so let me go through um so kind of a couple practical questions uh helen is asking where is this work held and i believe she's referring to the six seasons uh drawing that you showed at the very beginning Hi, Helen, and thank you so much. Isn't it a stunner? Um, the Six Seasons was, as um, Melanie, I don't know, you mentioned uh, that exhibition that took place at the Art Gallery of Canada. Sorry, I'm just doing a quick lean over. The beautiful catalog uh, is here, and we'll be sure to send a, a link from it. That work mm -hmm. wasn't included in the catalog. Um, and you know what, Helen? I don't exactly know, but I'm going to get my fingers really busy. Uh, and find out where it is. I know um, there's a website, um, there's a, something called the Resilience Project, and I know it's been used uh, there. Um, and uh, I, I will hopefully have an answer for you uh, before we uh, we sign off, uh, because I'm, I'm not sure always uh, where they um, these works are at any yeah. particular moment. So, uh, I'll and do no pressure, quick. Wendy. If, if we yeah. can also, you know, take time after and include that in the follow-up. So whatever works for you. Um, let's see. I have um, a question from Norma, who asks: Given that a small number of these 
artists achieved success due to sales in the south, like the mm-hmm. southern part of Canada, right, where where um, where the bigger cities are and where most people live, you know, in in the southern part of the country. Mm-hmm. So, did they remain living in the north? What was mm-hmm. the fabric of their social interactions with the neighbors, with their neighbors in the community? Um, so she's she goes on to clarify. I mean, you know, th- their work sold for for perhaps high prices. So what impact did that have on their lifestyle and their interactions with others? Thanks. That's a great question, Norma. Um, and I wish I had a happier answer to it. Um, uh, it is a complicated story about uh, the sale of Indigenous art. It's true here in Canada. I know it's true as well in Australia. I'm sure it's true in the United States is where wherever indigenous art is, it, it uh, tend to have been um, in many instances, at least bought at a cheap site price, sold at a high price to, to the detriment of the uh, artists themselves. Now, these artists, for the most part, while they may have come out for exhibitions and, and the like, uh, remained within the community. But um, yeah, the, the question of, of um, where the money went is a complicated one. Um, just to, to give you a sense of this, um, Ashavak, who I, I know the most about in terms of, of uh, the artists that we looked at today, um, I know there was a time when uh, one of her daughters had to buy her uh, groceries because she had no food in her house and she was trying to finish what would become um, an iconic kind of work of hers. Uh, because the money, it was always a question about where it went. And as I mentioned, I have uh, scholars and colleagues who know much more about uh, the economics of what happened with the artists at Cape Dorset. And I do know that uh, in the present moment, uh, that those issues are clearly being addressed by uh, dealers uh, and by institutions with the idea that, uh, that the exploitation of indigenous artists must be something that we uh, clearly make as part of our reconciliation process. So I wish I had a happier story to tell uh, about many of those artists whose works that we've seen, or if you go online, you'll see there's many, many artists. At one point in time, I think there was 54 different artists in Cape Dorset um, because of a co-op that was created there. Uh, but, you know, I guess I'm going to think hopefully, Norma, that, that those issues are a thing of the past and we're in the process uh, of reconciling with many of the injustices that were done to the Indigenous community. So I think that that's um, in the process of changing. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Um, yeah, very a complicated issue, like a complicated problem. and. Um, you know, one one that's certainly been repeated in history, right? It's it's not mm-hmm. always that the there's the money often doesn't make its way to the artist. Yeah, and for all kinds of reasons. Um, but I, I do know that um, the art institutions here in Canada, uh, any that receive for sure federal or provincial funding at this point in time, we're in the process of reconciliation. And part of that is to address some of these issues as best we can. Um, so I'll, I'll keep up, I'll keep hope. And as I said, I have some links to uh, works that uh, that'll give you a better answer and a fuller background by people who know much more on on those issues uh, than I can tell you about. Melanie, just before we go to the next question, can yeah, I answer sure. Helen's, Helen's questions? That none of what our land, that gorgeous six season mm-hmm. uh, painting, and just just uh, so if when you see it when, if you can access it online make sure you zoom in because it's so detailed and so it's just magnificent uh it is part of the collection of indigenous and northern affairs uh is what i'm learning online right now so there we go and and where is that wendy sorry uh, i i think it's part of a, indigenous and northern affairs is part of the government so that's all that uh, I can find for you at the moment. I will okay. keep looking uh, to see if it, um, it's on display anywhere. Thanks. 
Um, and just I'm just uh, chatting the answer to an uh, so you all have it in writing just for another kind of practical question about the last name um, of the artist Tim Pitsilak that Nan, that uh, Wendy mentioned. I put that I put his name in the chat, and there'll be links to further information about him as well in the follow up. And Here I think you Wendy, your your slide mentions him too. Yes. Yeah, here we are. This is a, a, a little tiny, beautiful book. Okay, so I have a few books and this is my floor. <laughs> I couldn't do any better today. Uh, this is a, a beautiful, tiny little book put together by Leslie Boy of drawings and prints of, of his. Um, he, he died very young uh, in his 40s as a result of complications due to pneumonia. He wasn't able to be evacuated fast enough. Uh, for his life to be safe. Uh, this is a beautiful collection of his works. And don't you love, don't you love the polar bear on the front? I mean, and then to think, as I kept on trying to emphasize, you know, that these are done with pencil crayons and paper, and then transformed sometimes into um, in, into um, prints. Uh, it, and it, just the skill. If you have a chance to look at some of the videos online that show the actual physical process of what's involved just stunning and those comments he made about patience takes on a, a whole new meaning so there you go you can see his name and i'm very happy to promote uh, leslie boyd's tiny elegant book uh of of his works uh that's there as well and um if you'd like to more the, the former question by norma about sort of the history and the economics inuit modern is uh the place to go uh the essays in it are so informative giving you a lot of the history, excuse me, and also a lot of the uh, economic elements or aspects to it. Great, thank you. And I just minimized the questions by mistake. Okay, let me, let me open that back up again. Um, a couple of questions about, about media. Um, mm -hmm. So, Linda, who was asking about, somebody was asking about, um, Paint. I know the uh, you're showing works that were done in pencil crown. Someone's also asking if there was paint used, um, and I guess, and about how it was procured. There was, was was is paint a, a media that's used a lot by by artists in the co-op? No, you know what? Ashabek sort of towards the very end of her life used tincture, which is a kind of paint and water mixture. Uh, she did do some works, as did Pitsiula, uh with oil pastels, um, but but not so much paint, not not too much paint by these artists, um, and I kind of admire that. I I kind of admire not going to the to to, to keeping the simplicity of the medium, right, and, and what that does in terms of inspiration. That you know, if if they could create works that were this beautiful with pencil, pen, uh, pastels, uh, how inspiring is that for all of us? You know, all those arguments, and I, I've heard them many times when I was teaching about. Well, when I take expensive lessons here, but when I get really good paints, when I get all, you know, there's a lot of when I's and if I had, and uh, I, I love the simplicity of the medium because it shows us that. You know, great beauty can be captured about the places and spaces we are in without without those complicated medium. But those are just simple excuses for our failure to sit down and do the work or our failure to look carefully at what's right around us. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and just a quick follow up from that. So someone was asking about the media used by the final artist, Lucy, and that was also Pencil Crown, I believe. I think so. I think most of her works are. And man, is she somebody to to continue to follow? Um, yeah, I will I will double check. This one for sure is is a pencil crayon. We can see the strokes right mm -hmm. here. That, um, this one I'm going to have to do a bit of work and see, uh, and I can follow up uh, with Melanie with that and and share it with you as to what's used. It looks like it's a print, so it could have originally been a pencil crayon and then in the print version. That's why we lose it, but uh, more research uh, to be done. And she is like sort of kind of new. You can notice this is 2019 uh, for this particular work. And I didn't have a date. I apologize to those at Expanding Inuit uh, for not having a date for this one. 
But again, to me, it looks like it's a print uh, that probably was pencil crayon first. If you look up here, you can see the brush strokes, or perhaps it was pastel. All right, thanks, Wendy. Um, um, Linda is asking, um, are the annual art auctions still held? Um, Linda, are you, can you say a little bit more about that? Um, if you could just uh, add some more context for us in the chat, or, or sorry, in the question box. In the meantime, um, lots, of, lots of wonderful comments, Wendy, thanking you. Um, let me go up here to Janet, where did she go? Or Jan I'm sorry, not uh, Janice. She says, thank you so much for helping us to see the beauty of the land around us. I was amazed by the prolonged and sustained attention and concentration that the mm. artists are showing to capture their beauty around them and, and their abilities to, to have both have this deep concentration, but also um, imagine in a, bring a playfulness often um, to, um, imagine in a playful way their own uh, internal sense of color form and style um, janet you made my day uh <laughs> janice sorry that was janice i misspoke janet. oh i'm so sorry janice my you fault. made my day uh because that was my great hope uh in in bringing this just a few these are there's so few in number uh of the artists that were part of this co-op uh and who continue to work from this area uh because i do find like so inspiring. I just like Snowflake Bentley, you know, so inspiring to figure out how to, snow, how to take a picture of something so small and, and so delicate as a snowflake. But these guys and their ability to look out at the landscape and and to really, you know, that, that quote from Ashavak about happiness just sticks with me all the time. And uh, it's on my mug. Enchanted uh, Owl is on my mug because it reminds me that, you know, there's happiness to be found anywhere if only we have the hearts open and minds uh, open and eyes open wide enough uh, to find it. And uh, I have to say, when I first, I was very hesitant when I first uh, looked at Ashavak's work and uh, she became uh, a very, you know, there's some artists that become really personal to you and you feel like you were meant to spend time with their work and you were meant to think about them and they become sort of part of making you who you are. And I have a really clear sense with, with her work about that. So thanks, Janice, for uh, sharing in my enthusiasm uh, today. Uh, thanks, Wendy. Judy had also mentioned that she has this uh, enchanted owl mug from the exhibit. Um, Anna Maria, kind of along the same, you know, along similar li lines to Janice, um, says, far from not wanting winter scenes, your lectures have increased my existing love of winter and the complexity of colors and lives um, and ask for more uh, more related to the seasons we Thank will you. do our best to oblige well, uh, we'll we'll be we're already thinking on that one i think samantha's listening in uh, <laughs> I think we're and, and also remember i do want to do a bit of a promo for next week because i want this look at winter uh, to kind of continue and um, you know first we looked at Bentley and we looked at the simple and the small in winter to find beauty and this week we looked at you know these artists who live in these places with ice and and snow and cold did I minus mention minus 26 so I'm not sure how many of you know how cold minus 26 is and I think I did say minus 37 and it dropped a degree or two it was on my phone <laughs> It dropped a degree or two while we've been chatting. Uh, I lived in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba, uh, which is known for its cold. The coldest I did when I was in Winnipeg, I did have a day at minus 52. Uh, and the whole city shut down and it, it was quite magical. Um, we, we talked about these artists who live in cold places and cold spaces and, and how they come to look at the landscape, the landscape on the outside and the landscape on the inside. Next week, uh, I'm going to be in conversation with David McEwen, and here he is. Uh, as you mentioned at the top, Melanie, uh, he's been painting the Arctic and the Antarctic for I think it's almost close to 30 years. He's been going year after year. And like, what draws you to these places is one of my big questions, and I can't wait to have a conversation with him. We're going to be so lucky because he's actually inviting us into his studio. We'll have a chance uh, to have a conversation with him from there. He's going to 
I think show us some of his works in progress, some of the works that he's at. Uh, talk to us about just how hard it is to do watercolor that ends up looking like this, watercolor in the Arctic. I, 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 I'm fascinated by the medium, but, uh, and to talk to him about how you capture light. Uh, I think it's gonna be a wonderful uh, time uh, that we'll be able to continue to think about this notion of winter during this particularly hard winter uh, and, to, and to find out what draws people there and, and what fascinates them. So uh, I hope many of you will be joining us uh, for that as well. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks for mentioning that, Wendy. Yeah, we're trying something a little different. Uh, Wendy said uh, taking you into David's studio, and that's going to be that's going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, okay, just a couple more questions before we have to sign off. Um, Noreen, um, so Wendy, I know your you your area is, is really more um, uh, paintings and paintings, prints, and, and drawings. Um, Noreen asks about um, the embroidery and textile artists. In the area, if you know, and we can definitely direct uh, direct Noreen towards some resources, uh, Wendy. If, if I know that's, I know your bailiwick is more in the works, in the painting and stuff. It is, and you know what? I I, I mentioned wishing I had more time because um, for sure, especially with Ashavik, who really was, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, kind of the first really internationally known, acclaimed Inuit artist that we had. She talked about so. Uh, she she talks about um, the influence of the embroiderers, for example, and of tapestry on her work. And when you look at those pencil drawings that she did, I showed you an early one, and it was all like little tiny dots. Um, you you can't help but go, yeah. The you see the connection between the two. And I have to tell you, I am a great lover of embroidery. I I think I showed everybody my failed attempt. To make a snowflake Bentley. Oh yes, <laughs> that's good. No, what are you talking oh, about? okay. I'm sending it to you, Melanie, in California. <laughs> um, I like it. Uh, and, and I come from a family of very talented embroiderers and quilters, and uh, I have such appreciation. And I see a, the parallels you're talking about. And there are so many other artists from there. You know, you mentioned the textile and tapestry workers, the embroiderers. We could have also talked, you know, I, I had a couple of pictures that I clicked through up and on about the sculptures, uh, the sculptors in this area, which are exquisite and forceful and full of life. And uh, I had to narrow it somehow. And given the medium, and I have a strong belief that uh, sculpture teaches us about touch and is three-dimensional. So I always find it hard to do sculpture on a screen. But there will be a day and there will be a time when the world opens up again and uh, uh, perhaps we can all uh, go back out and, and investigate and look at where indigenous sculpture is uh, and, and try to learn as much as we can from it because it is a, a stunning thing. Melanie, can I quick give a, another shout out to an artist who's highly influenced by embroidery, another indigenous artist, which is yeah, yeah, a, a Christy Balacor. Uh, is an indigenous artist uh, from here in Ontario and her exquisite works. Uh, the McMichael Gallery in uh, Kleinberg, that's McMichael, MC, Michael Gallery, just did a magnificent, magnificent exhibition of her work. I wept all the way through, it was so full of joy. And she takes embroidery and transforms uh, that technique of dots and dashes, that intricacy, into these huge canvases that are breathtaking. Um, so if you don't know Christy Bellacore's work, please look her up online. Please try to support her uh, any way you can uh, because uh, she is a treasure. And I have to say she had a work called The Universe. And um, at the Art Gallery of Ontario, we used to have a, a competition every year where we'd ask people to vote for their favorite. And uh, when, when The Universe was part of our collection, it won, I think a couple of years in a row because it is a magnificent again, transformation of embroidery into art by an indigenous artist who understands it in ways that uh, that perhaps, given my cultural background, I can't quite appreciate as well. It was muted, sorry. Um, I think <laughs> I spelled it correctly. I put her name in, and the McMichael Gallery name in the yeah. chat. Yeah, it just as it sounds, B-E-L-A, court. With 
the T on the end. Yes. Um, oh, and Ronnie is uh, pointing out that it's on through April. There's videos on the site, so we will oh. include those videos. Um, well, uh, did I mention breathtaking? Totally breathtaking. Um, yes. All right. So I, we do have to wrap it up. Um, when, I will be sure to get Wendy all of the very uh, kind and thoughtful comments that you all sent and uh, try to, uh, I know we have a couple of unanswered questions, but try to address as many of those we, as we can in, in the follow-up email. Uh, we will see you all back here next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern to uh, have Wendy's Q&A with the painter David McEwen, McEwen sorry. And, um, and that will, as, as I mentioned, that will be the last part of the Armchair Art Tours Polar Edition, but our webinar series continues through the, through the year because uh, we are, it's an online world for the moment. Um, and Wendy herself has a lot going on with both Classical Pursuits and Worldwide Quest, small group seminars, and a trip to Gromorn, Newfoundland, in, uh, thank you, Samantha, in September. Um, so as always, any questions about any of these things, please email Samantha or me. And, um, you know, we remain committed to bringing all of you a mix of things throughout the year. We, we, may, we remain committed to offering these free presentations. Um, you know, and continuing our our seminars and stuff. So if you if you can, if you I know a lot of you are attending the seminars. If you if you're if you're thinking about taking the plunge, um, but you're not sure, just give us a call. We can help you out. Tell you more about it. Um, we'll see you see everyone and Wendy back next week. Thank you so much, Wendy. As always. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, anything else from you, Wendy? Before we head out. No, it's snowing harder. <laughs> Did I mention Wendy the Weather Witch? It's, uh, Wendy the Weather Witch. It's uh, snowing harder. And uh, I'm going to go sit by my big picture window and look out at that garden and uh, and think about uh, what uh, these artists are, are teaching me. Thank you, everybody. I so appreciate it. Thank you, Wendy. See you next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>